boys! It's the eclipse day. Did you see the eclipse? There was an eclipse. It was an eclipse outside. Totality. A total solar eclipse. That's what happened today. What a wild ride of emotions that it was. I don't know about you, but for months in advance, this has been being hyped the fuck up as like, hey, we have a total solar eclipse and it's going straight across the United States of America, passing over, I, I guess, a bunch of major metropolitan areas. And so much so that it, it was being touted as potentially being the most viewed solar eclipse uh, in our lifetimes. Because, you know, they happen every now and again, but where they happen is always what's going to be uh, up for debate or, or up for grabs. We never know. Um, anyway, so everyone's looking forward to it. People traveled, right? People booked hotels. People came from miles away. Um, and then the night before we get the news. There's going to be clouds. <laughs> The clouds came in, Mother Nature was like, bitch, you wanted to see this eclipse, but we're going to make it kind of difficult to do so. So that was definitely a damper. However, both anecdotally for myself, I can attest to the fact that I was able to catch a couple of glimpses of the eclipse. And um, it seems from perusing social media today... That's kind of the case it was for most people. From most pictures I've seen, it looks like everybody was dealing with some bad cloud coverage, but was looking for like little gaps and openings in the cloud where the eclipse would appear and then go away. We had about four minutes of totality and what everyone got to experience if you were in the eclipse path, whether or not you got to see like the ring, you know, the little corona of the sun as nicely as you would have liked to, um, I think the wildest part and the coolest part was like quite literally watching the sky go from bright and sunny to fucking nighttime ass dark in a, in the course of like in in probably like under 2 minutes of time like the 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 progression was wild cuz as the the moon is coming over the sun it starts to get dark very slowly it's so it's very gradual you're like all right the sky is getting a little bit darker but then that moment that the moon is hitting totality it's like oh oh it's going all the way off it was actually very cool just to like physically watch how fast the sky turned to dark um and and then see it come back so that was very cool I went over to a couple of my friends' uh, place uh, in uh, in Orchard Park. They own a lot of land. We went out into their field, and we tried our best to hunt down the eclipse. I got a couple of pictures. You can see them on my Instagram. Um, but hopefully you had a chance to look at the sun. Let me get my hellos in order. Fiction of Grander. Sorry to hear that you are hacked. That's very unfortunate. Changeling, DJ, John Brown, Jacob Welsh, um, and Tim W. Nice. Um, hi, Toronto's whole sky was overcast during the eclipse, but I saw Texas was amazing. Niagara was charging hundreds for hotels and parking and they had clouded skies. Yeah, the hotels here in Buffalo, uh, by the Buffalo airport, we had another big controversy. I can't remember if I talked about this on stream, but there is a hotel called the Aloft. Aloft hotels, they're, they're like, a, you can find them many places, but there's one specifically, a location by the Buffalo Airport. Yes, we have one of those. We have an airport. <laughs> um, they got in some really hot water because they basically canceled people's reservations. There was a booking company that booked a whole bunch of travelers who wanted to come for the eclipse. They were, they, they literally booked these hotel rooms. Aloft became aware that, um, it was the eclipse and they probably could have surge, surge charged. They could have charged a fuck ton more for the rooms than what they did. So they simply just canceled these reservations that they had on all of these people kind of last minute uh, to then rebook the rooms at these supercharged prices. I am not super educated in the world of hotels. What they did in my brain, it sounds like it's something that is supposed to be illegal. Like, I, I feel like you shouldn't be allowed to do it. It's definitely scummy. Um, and, and I would argue whether it's illegal or not, it's terrible business practice um, in terms of, like, getting loyal customers. Because, you know, people were 
pissed. Understandably so. Like, we're all human people. Imagine you book a hotel somewhere because you want to go see an event and your hotel literally just cancels the reservation on you at the last minute because they're like, well, we could charge somebody else more. That's... That, that, that feels like it's supposed to be illegal. So I don't, quite frankly, I don't know how they were able to do it. It, it, it just feels vile. Um, and so it was a major news story in our area because we did get a lot of travelers from out of town for the eclipse that unfortunately got cloudy weather. So that's what it is. <laughs> um, I would have been livid. Me too. Anyways, the eclipse is done now. The sun is out. You can see it behind me. Uh, it's time for me to go back to court. I, I'm i so curious if we'll be able to finish this game this week. Uh, probably. At the rate things go, probably not. But we're going to keep on trucking. We're here today to listen to the testimony of Gina Lestrade. I think she's going to set the record straight. Or at least that's what we're all hoping, for the love of God. Um, so I'm going to get started on that. Happy Eclipse Day, boys! Uh, now let's sit back and let's relax and uh, move on with our lives because that is over. That is done It's I don't think we're getting another one for a long time. All right <clears throat> Let's begin So the court will now hear the testimony of the defendant Miss Gina Lestrade You witnesses currently in the stand may step down until further notice. Oh, I forgot about him. Then I shall bid you a good day. Wait. Oh. You, sir, shall remain in the stand while Miss Lestrade testifies. Oh. As you wish. Alright then, Gina, it's time. Yes, no firebenders were harmed during the making of this eclipse. I know this is gonna be hard, but please, just put your faith in me. Good luck, Runo! Thanks. I'm gonna need it. Alright, come on, Gina. For the love- for, for once in your life, do not disappoint me. All you want is the approval of a nice father figure. I can give that to you. I can be your daddy. If you just don't fuck this up and ruin it for me and disappoint me again. For once in your goddamn pathetic life of being a poverty-stricken pickpocket, I need you to make somebody proud of you. No pressure! <laughs> the articles that Mr. McGilded had deposited in Windebank's pawn brokery. They're intimately related with the Omnibus case, the trial of which was heard in this courtroom two months ago. Yes, and I remember this young lady being brought before me in that trial as well. That's right, my lord. Her testimony helped to establish the innocence of the defendant, Mr. McGilded. The omnibus case was intriguing, to say the least. And now, here we all are again, the same players in that trial facing each other once more. A twist of fate, perhaps, my Nipponese friend. Yeah, or maybe it's not so much fate as much as it is that you seem to be the only prosecutor and I seem to be the only lawyer in these parts. Anyways, uh, allow me to recap the events of two months ago. An old brickmaker was stabbed to death in an omnibus running along the London Street Winter Streets. Yes. Thrice fired Mason. Apart from the victim, there was only one other person in the carriage, Mr. McGilded. Naturally, he was the prime suspect for the murder. But as the trial progressed, another possibility had emerged. That the murder, in fact, took place above the defendant's head on the roof of the deck. On the roof deck. Blech. With the body then being dropped through the skylight into the carriage below. It was Miss Lestrade whose testimony brought that possibility to light. At the time of the incident, Miss Lestrade was concealed under a seat in the carriage hoping to pick the pockets of unsuspecting passengers. Then, immediately after the trial, having been acquitted of the murder, Mr. McGilded died in this very courtroom, in the most extraordinary of circumstances. A mystery that remains unsolved even to now, two months on, as indeed does the omnibus murder itself. 
Be that as it may, I recall neither the disc nor this small box being mentioned in the course of those proceedings. Miss Lestrade! Would you tell the court now, please? What really happened in the omnibus two months ago? I don't know what you mean! I already said all of what I know! And what about everything you told us yesterday from inside of your prison cell? Ah! Look, Miss Lestrade, this is extremely important. I don't have time for your bullshit. But, but... Remember this, little girl. If it transpires that you willfully withheld information in the trial two months ago, the Home Office will seek to prosecute you for perjury. Oh! And naturally, you will lose all credibility as a witness. Although, let's face facts, you have little credibility to lose. Oh, boom, roasted! Wait, I'm on her scene. Shit. Jenny! Don't listen to him! Please! You have to trust in Runo now! Iris! We're on your side! I know you're not the most educated woman, so it's a little hard for you to figure it out, but like, we're on your side, so just tell the fucking truth! Alright then, I'll talk. It's about goddamn time. I, I, mean, I mean it's the right choice, Gina. Well, it would seem that my learned friend is hell-bent on bringing the entire courtroom about his ears, so be it. Great. I must confess, I'm struggling to understand what in the fuck is happening here. However, it would appear that Mr. McGilded's pawned articles in that extraordinary case of the Omnibus harbor secrets of which we've been hitherto unaware. So, Miss Lestrade, you will now give your testimony before the court about the events of two months ago. You will reveal the truth, a commodity sorely lacking in your original statements. This is it, then. Everything's gonna come out. Like Von Zeke said. This could bring the whole courtroom down about my ears. But as a lawyer, I am prepared to take that risk. What does that even mean? Alright, Gina. Spill the motherfucking tea. You know what we do not want? We do not want an Annalise Vanderpool. For any of you on TikTok, that is a reference to Chelsea from That's So Raven. Annalise Vanderpool. I used to fucking love that woman because I loved Chelsea on uh, That's So Raven. And when she first started making TikToks, I was like, oh my God, it's Chelsea from That's So Raven. That's amazing. But then she came in with some hot tea. She's like, yo, I got the tea about That's So Raven. And then she never spilled it. And then her whole entire career seems to be making more and more TikToks being like, Guys, don't you want to know the tea I have on That's All Raven? And everybody on TikTok is like, No! We don't care anymore! Leave us alone! <laughs> don't be that, Gina. The truth is, the Brickmaker Cove was in the cabin of the Omnibus the whole time. When the Irishman dragged me out from under the seat, I saw that disc on the floor. All of a sudden, I heard a scream from over me head, and that pair on the roof deck went to call the shops. That's when McGill did slip to the driver something to do a run on the pawn shop around. What? He threatened me not to snitch, not to say nothing to no one about what I'd seen or heard. Oh, good grief, that's outrageous. What you've told the court bears almost no resemblance to your testimony two months ago. As you say, my lord. Well, then there's every chance I may have adjudicated an error in McGilded's trial. It sounds very much to me as if the man deliberately deceived this court. Or do you guys have double jeopardy here? <laughs> in an effort to cover up the most wicked of schemes. Without doubt, your lordship, correct. A great injustice was done in this courtroom two months ago. The actions of the accused in that trial, of this witness, and of my learned friend are entirely inexcusable! Okay, sweetie, calm down. 
The whole trial was a farce, Frankie! Oh, Franny, that McGilded fellow was actually evil! Don't forget that lawyer from the East! That all scum! Yeah, Nipponese scum! You're wrong, you lot of a... Mr. Nero Otto, the lawyer there, didn't even know nothing about it! Humbug! I just don't think that's true. Are we really supposed to believe that? He really stitched everyone up, didn't he? What an operation to get the man off scot-free! Unforgivable! Stop! The lies have to stop! Stop! Yes! The defense made a terrible error of judgment. And I intend to take full responsibility and suffer whatever consequences are deemed appropriate. Let me get my ukulele out. <laughs> Toxic gossip train! <laughs> However, it's imperative that the court allows the witness to elaborate on her testimony. Because the true significance of McGilded's pond articles might be brought to light. Very well, my learned student friend. Students, not Nipponese? Given the depths of the calamity you have just plunged yourself into, this may well be worth hearing. Great. No words fail me. This situation is utterly deplorable. Mr. Naruhodo. Yeah, my lord. I will decide upon your fate following the conclusion of this trial. Bitch, I'm not the one who lied, it's her! I mean, of course, my lord. Blimey, Mr. Naruhodo! Now, counsel, proceed with the cross-examination. Right, I'm starting to get hot in here. I need to... And I don't think I can turn on my fan, because I'm not really wearing pants at the moment. The real truth of the omnibus case, so let's go through it. Alright, we better, uh, press everything. So you were hiding in the in the cabin at the time as well. Isn't that true, Miss Lestrade? If I remember rightly, in the storage compartment underneath one of the seats. Yeah, that's right. It's pitch black under there, so you can't see nothing at all. Now, in your testimony two months ago, I feel certain that you claimed Mr. McGilded was the sole passenger, did you not? False testimony, my lord. Th that's what he told me I had to say? But it's important that you tell us the truth now. Were Mr. McGilded and the victim acquaintances? I don't know. But I did hear him talking a lot. Uh, what were they talking about? Well, I couldn't hear too well, but if I had to say... I think it was about money or something. They kept talking about buying and not buying. Hmm. Perhaps business dealings of some kind. Well, anyway, they got louder and louder. It started to sound like a proper fight. I was pretty scared by then, and I hardly dared breathe, and all of a sudden... I heard a noise like someone keeling over on the floor. It was blooming loud and all. And I believe you let out an involuntary scream. Yeah, that's what gave me away. Alright, then he dragged her out from under the seat and she saw the Holy disc on the floor. Was the disc you saw this disc? Yeah, I reckon it probably was. It was right next to the cove lying on the floor. Could this disc have belonged to the victim, perhaps? I don't know, but McGill did have picked it up pretty smartish. And then he sat over the cove with a knife and his belly up on the seat. What did he say to you at that time? He told me not to say a word about what I'd seen or heard to no one. About the disc and everything. I was dead scared. The way he was looking at me, I thought, if I didn't go along with it, I'd get stuck with that knife too. Hmm. And then he started asking me a load of questions, like what my name was, and where I lived, all that stuff. He asked me about being a diver too. But after a while, what happened in the carriage was noticed. Well, yeah, that's right. I mean, first there was kind of a rapping noise. And then she heard a scream from over her head, and the pair on the roof deck went off to call the slops. Alright, so that's when the witnesses come into play. There were two gentlemen occupying the seats on the roof deck, right? That's right. 
They must have looked down through the skylights and noticed the cove with the knife in its guts. Yeah, the daddy and the twink. When they screamed, the driver pulled up the horses and McGill had got me out of sight. Out of sight where? Back under the seat where I started off. Once the carriage came to an halt, the two coves from the roof ran off to fetch the slops. If they immediately left to fetch the police, it would appear they were entirely unrelated to the incident. Hmm. So that left McGilded, the driver, and you still at the scene. Yeah, only the driver didn't know I was there, because I was under the seat. I heard the cabin door open, and a voice from outside. The driver, yes. He also testified in the trial, I believe. A fellow who went by the name of Beppo, if memory serves, sir! What did McGilded and the driver say to each other? I don't know what happened, and stuff like that, mainly. And that's when McGilded slipped the driver some tin to do a run to the pawn shop roundabout. Okay. That pawn shop obviously being Windbanks on Baker Street. Now just a moment, Counsel. Do you mean to tell me that the driver gave false testimony in that trial as well? Perhaps the excursion to the pawnbroker he slipped his mind when he was in the stand. Oh, yeah, perhaps, Lord Von Seeks. McGilder took off his coat and gave it to the driver. He folded it up all careful like before ending it over. When I saw him do that, I remember thinking, that coat and what's in it has got to be worth a few bob. Right. Gina was sure that the disc must be worth more than Mr. Windebank was suggesting. I remember her quibbling with him over the price that afternoon at the pawnbrokery. Our driver looked pretty happy when McGill did flash some brass in his face. He went running off at a leak. And then the bog trotter called to me and told me to come out from the Drax's cabin. Threaten me not to snitch, not to say nothing to no one about what I had seen. How exactly did he threaten you? He told me I'd only be able to scarp her if I did exactly what he said. Which included giving false testimony in court two months ago? Yeah, that's it. And there was also one other thing he said. Which was? It told me I have to hang on to the ticket from the pawn shop and make sure not to lose it. The ticket? Oh, well, I never. Said that if he didn't show up to get the ticket off me before two months had passed, I had to go to the pawn shop and pay the money to keep it in log to stop it being forfeited. He left me with some brass to pay for it. Oh, but really, why would Mr. McGilded have done such a thing? Depositing his overcoat with the pawnbroker before the arrival of the police. You know, that makes no sense. There appears to be only one logical explanation, my lord. What McGilded had the driver to, uh, what McGilded had the driver deposit... Yeah. <laughs> Why am I fucking this up? What McGilded had the driver deposit at Windebanks was something that he didn't want the police to see. Something very important. Something he needed to hide, at all costs. Anyway, after that he let me go. So I legged it before the coppers showed up. Well done, Gina. Good job. And Ginny's really put her faith in you, Runo! Yeah, it's about damn time. Fortunately, to thank her, she'll get to face a charge for perjury once the trial's over. I just need to use this time that we have now to get as much information out of her as possible, and then leave her... to rot. <laughs> it's time to really go for it! Press her on every statement! I kinda did already. Oh, and another thing? Yeah, what's that? Oh, you should look at those two. It's kinda strange, but they've been whispering to each other the entire time. Yeah, I didn't even notice that. It's like they're having a secret discussion about something. I'm not sure I'm completely comfortable with that. I wonder if there's anything I can do about it. Could I? Um... Um... Hold it! 
Uh, uh. Okay. All right. Let me. Let me. Let me. Let me think for a second. Wait. Can I just pursue? Excuse me. Is there something that you would like to share with the court, Inspector Gregson and Mr. Graydon? Hey! Fuck tards! Mr. Naruhodo, I'm sorry, I meant to say Inspector Gregson and, uh, Ashley. <laughs> Blimey! You're trying to give me a heart attack. Listen. You guys are just blatantly whispering to each other and ignoring what's going on in the card room. It's been going on for quite some time, and I'd really like to know what you fucks are talking about, alright? This is also how you call out students in the classroom. <laughs> uh, discussion! With this fella! No, you better pull the other one, Sunshine. You think I've got anything to talk about with a shady green gent like this? And I have nothing to say to this uncouth detective after he deprived me of that disc that was rightfully mine. But they've clearly been talking the entire time that I've been cross-examining Gina. It's as if they've been negotiating. Well, thank you, Miss Lestrade, and thank you, Counsel. You know, I think I've heard enough. I believe we now have a reasonable understanding of what actually transpired on the omnibus. It would appear, on that night two months ago, a negotiation was taking place on the omnibus. A negotiation concerning this disc. However, matters did not run smoothly. When the parties involved began to quarrel over the price, McGilded took what he wanted by force. At the expense of the other man's life, no doubt. Which proves my point, that the disc is clearly extremely valuable in some way. Although I don't understand why. And two days ago, precisely two months after the omnibus incident, McGilded's coat and its contents were due to be forfeited. I didn't know what I should do with the ticket. I mean, the cough died right after the trial. I knew that. So you decided you would try to claim the articles as your own. Well, why not, eh? they were only going to be forfeited, why shouldn't I have got them? Anyway, you can't blame me for thinking about it. Thinking ain't no crime. Miss Lestrade, it would appear Mr. McGilded was prepared to kill in order to take possession of this disc. Do you know why that would be? Huh? Oh, I don't know. But I reckon it must be worth a fair bit of brass. He was probably going to sell it. And you can't blame me for thinking that. Thinking ain't no crime. Hmm. I suppose- My lord! Oh. What? Oh! The evidence your lordship requested has been located, sir. It's ready for the court's inspection, sir. Someone was requesting evidence? Did I forget this from the last stream? Maybe. What? Oh, this is big. Oh shit, it's the box! The mysterious little box deposited by McGilded two months ago. I forgot about his box. There's no doubt in my mind that it's a key piece in this far-reaching puzzle. Yeah, for sure. Oh, that's the to be continued? No shit! Wow, we're only 30 minutes in. All right, you know what? I guess we have time to keep going. We could probably go for another half hour, start up the next part of this. So if we save, that means we're on trial, what, part four? I do believe, I do believe part four is the final part of this trial, which means in the next week of streams that we have, we might be finishing this game this week. Oh my god, and I'm starting to get a little bit invested because we're finally in like the meat of this story and I don't really know what's going on. Uh, all right, yeah, let's let's see it through to the end. I mean, not tonight, but we'll see how far we can get into this. There it is, boys, it's a box. So, this is the article in question, is it? The small box deposited with the pawnbroker by Mr. McGilded two months ago. And on the night of Mr. Windebank's murder, 
The only item on the shelves that was touched by whoever broke into the shop. Quick, let's open it and see what's inside. Is that a spring trap? It's a music box! <gasps> Girl, let's play the disc! Oh, good gracious, this is no ordinary box. Yeah, you know, in truth, I had an inkling that might be the case. How, you know, I've th this whole case, we've been looking for a music box to play the disc. I don't know how it never registered in my brain that the small box inside of the shop could be a music box. It would appear that the box houses a miniature music box movement. Johnny Petriello, hello, welcome to court. Then is it too much to expect? I think it would be reasonable to assume that it is a device for the playback of this disc, my lord. Alright, here's some hot tea. Can we play- Can we play the disc? So here we have the means to play back Mr. McEwden's disc, deposited at Windabanks at much the same time. Not strictly correct, my lord. It was not McGilded's disc. It was the disc of his victim on the omnibus. But why? For heaven's sake, what the fuck is going on? Are we to understand that the Brickmaster was trying to sell this music box disc to Mr. McGilded? Um... I have a thought, your honor, your majesty, your lordship. I believe the answer will become clear if we listen to the music on the disc. Please, please play the disc. Yes, very well. Let the court now listen to this curious disc at last. Oh my god, I am hype. We have been waiting for this. Hold it. Fuck! Wait, my lord! What? Oh, good grief. What is the meaning of this, Inspector? The music box and the disc are, um... Well, they're unrelated to the case. No need to spoil the submir atmosphere, somber atmosphere in the courtroom with some silly bit of music. Objection. What? Are you out of your goddamn mind? The disc may very well have motivated the culprit in this case to commit murder! Clearly there's every chance that it's fundamentally important to understanding what had happened. The prosecution is no objection. But, no! Wait, what? That piece of evidence is hardly a, a, a... Clearly Scotland Yard has some vested interest here. But it's policy of this prosecutor to leave no avenues unexplored. And you, Inspector, have no jurisdiction here to prevent that from happening. Ah, oh, fuck. Well, no further delays. Please, just play the fucking disc. Okay. Is it... Is it Morse code? Is it a hidden message? Is it a palindrome? <laughs> Wait... I don't know Morse code. Well, what on earth? That's certainly not what I would call music. No, it's not. It's just... It's the same note, playing over and over again in an irregular sequence. Hmm. <laughs> Mr. Graydon! Ashley? This really is priceless. Mmm, yes. Ah. After all that, the music box... It's broken! Broken?! Is that correct? Well, obviously. In fact, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. If the officer sent to fetch it didn't drop it on the way back to the courtroom. Well, with much regret, I feel the court must accept that this music box offers little in the way of clues. Are you ready to move on, counsel? No. What? Wait, but my whole- the whole plot was gonna come together. It does sound as though it's completely broken, but 
Are we sure that that's what it is? My first guess was that it was Morse code. Could the music emanating from this box possibly be a new clue? I think it could. I believe it could be relevant, my lord. Oh, good lord. But how can that be? It's an abomination, Count, or mere noise. I fail to see how it has any meaning whatsoever. It does sound strange. I agree to that. But there's something that's been bothering me. While Ashley stands there chortling victoriously, the inspector beside him has a rather telling expression on his face. It's as if Gregson recognizes the sound. As if he's familiar with it. Somehow. It's making him appear extremely on edge. Detectives, man. They have no fucking poker face game. If that's the stance of the defense, my Nipponese friend, answer me this! Yeah? Just what relevance do you propose this woeful chiming has on this case? Um... It's the defense's belief that... The sound emanating from this music box is, uh, not actually music. No, it's a message. Just because it's a music box, that doesn't necessarily mean that the sounds we're hearing are intended to be music. Huh, the smile wiped it right off of Ashley's face. I'm on the right lines here. I must be. <laughs> Making deductions based on how people react to what you say! You're acting just like a heroine, Runo! Objection. Man, I wish susato sound was here. The sound we're hearing aren't necessarily music. Well, now that you've told us what they are not... I'm sure the court would like to hear what they are. Do enlighten us, my Nipponese friend. Well... Um, surely you have an idea in mind, because if not, it will be the death of your ill-formed argument. Exactly. The music box is clearly broken. Refusing to accept that fact is just pure foolishness. I don't really know what the answer is. Um, Runo, I've just examined the music box very thoroughly. And I'm fairly certain that it's not broken at all. Really? Uh-huh. Really. The way it's been made, it can only produce a single note anyway. Oh. Well, thank you, Iris. Okay. So if the music box isn't broken... It's gotta mean that the sounds are producing have some significance that isn't musical in nature. Ah! Could it be? That's what the sounds are. You know, something's just struck me, Runo. I feel like recently, like in the past few hours even, I've heard another sound very much like the one this music box makes. Wait, what? A single note sound that this music box makes. Yeah. It's a familiar sound. It's not familiar to me, what? I mean, are we building- are we building to something that is different than Morse code? Actually, wait, Iris. I was just thinking the same thing. I'm gonna have to press the defense for an answer. If your assertion is that the sound produced by this music box is in fact- is not in fact music at all, then what the devil is it, Council? Well, all the evidence we've seen so far, all the testimony we've heard... It's all pointing to a single answer now, and I think I know what the answer is, too. 
Um, and it looks like Chad also knows what the answer is too, but chat, remember, we try to keep speculations to a minimum until I explicitly ask for help. Um, because I, I, I was on board with the, the Morse code and the telegram thing, but I personally kind of forgot a little bit about juror number five. However, now that chat has thrown it out there, yeah. The woman who does the telegram, she literally knows our suspect, Eggs Benedict, because he's also a communications guy who works in telegram making shit or whatnot. And so that's where the familiar noise is from. Okay, I see it. But yes, try to try to keep your speculations to a minimum because I want to have my own brain blasts. It's all pointing to a single answer. The prosecution demands that my learned Nipponese friend present proof now. Tangible proof of this latest wild speculation. Right, I'm getting to that. Okay then. This could be the best chance I'm gonna get to fight back in this trial. And if I'm right, it's gonna join all of my dots together. Dots, I see what he did there. The evidence that explains the true nature of the sounds on the music box disc is... Okay, so now, wait, what? <laughs> Um, uh, ooh, uh, is it a photograph? No. Do I have a copy of a telegram anywhere? The autopsy report. Uh, today's paper. Is it the paper? Oh, that's the pawnbroker's plunder. Is it this? What is this article about again? Sensational story lower down the front page. Ministry mole. Classified secrets may have been leaked overseas from the Ministry of Justice. For a 10-year-old, I certainly, yeah, it's about secret communications between Great Britain and its allies. Apparently, they're being intercepted by hostile nations. Okay, that's the question. I've come up with three different possible methods. Are you looking for a new career? No, of course not. I wonder. Um, it could be, and it could explain a lot. Okay, so th th this is going to come into play here for sure. Um. But... Gilded case notes, Iris's manuscript, blood samples, pawnbroker ticket, representation papers. Um, interesting. So, contains an article about government secrets being leaked to foreign agencies. This is the only thing that has, that, that I am seeing with my own two eyes that has any relevance at all to like communications, right? And communications that could be being done by telegram. I don't see anything else that looks like it would fit. Sure. Maybe throw it out there? Take that! Today's paper, Council. Bad line is pawnbroker perishes in pick purse plunder, hardly supportive of your case. Well, no, my lord. I was hoping that we could uh, talk about the other article further down on the page. Further down. Ministry more. Classified secrets may have been leaked overseas from Ministry of Justice. Yes, this is a very serious matter being investigated at the highest level, I understand. I have heard that international transmissions along supposedly secure lines are somehow being intercepted and leaked to various other countries. And presumably, those transmissions are in the form of wired telegrams. Of course. Juror number five, give me your input, please. Stop! Oh! Me, sir? Whatever is the matter? You told the court before that you worked at the same communication station as Mr. Graydon. I'm sorry, I meant to say Ashley. Is that correct? But yes, that's correct. And the particular station where you work? It deals with government communications and newspaper reports, right? Well, yes, we're not your run-of-the-mill communication station at all. Our work is extremely important. Then tell me, is this not a very familiar sound to you? Hmm. 
There it is. You don't mean to say... Is it... That's right, madame. It bears more than a passing resemblance to the sound made by your telegraph machine as you tap it. I believe it's called... Morse fucking code. So once again, your daddy George has solved the mystery from miles away from where we were getting at. Um, we just took, the, the game just took a lot longer to get there. <laughs> it's Morse code! Well, I don't believe it at all! Now correct me if I'm wrong, but when it comes to leaking telegrams from government departments, there could be nobody more perfectly placed than a highly skilled communications officer. Are you suggesting that the music box disc contains stolen government secrets in Morse code? Girls, spill the tea. What are those secrets? Order! Please, everyone. This is... That would be high treason, Council, deserving of capital punishment. Too much new vocabulary. What is treason? What is capital punishment? The sorts of words I'd have expect you to know. For our sovereign government's confidential information, hostile nations would surely pay almost any price. Yeah, and on that night two months ago, that was the very negotiation that was taking place inside the omnibus. But in the end, McGilded perished, and the all-important disc lay unclaimed in the pawn brokery. My word! In which case, whoever stole that information in the first place must surely have been beside himself with worry because if the disc were to be discovered before it found its way out of the country, it would reveal an act of high treason punishable by death. So the culprit had no choice but to retrieve it, and in order to do that, he would have to gain entry to the pawn brokery illegally in the middle of the night, because the article left behind by Mr. McGilded would incriminate him too much if it got into the wrong hands. Isn't that right, Ashley? It's Mr. Graydon! You think that I've been stealing government secrets? Preposterous! Absolutely, utterly preposterous! So in response to the defense's accusation, you claim complete innocence, do you? Well, of course I do! I've had to stand here in silence with that pretentious foreign lawyer and he's been prattling away! Objection. Then by all means, counter the charges. The prosecution demands the witness testifies. In response to the accusations brought by the defense. Delighted, I'm sure. The witness is reminded that the crime under scrutiny in this trial is the murder of the pawnbroker, Mr. Windebank. That being a most flagi 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 fla fla a most capital offense for which the law of this land sanctions a capital punishment. But the heinous act of high treason is no less a serious crime. I urge you to bear that in mind as you testify, Mr. Graydon. Oh, then. Well, let's proceed. What? Oh. Huh? Whose hold it was that? You gotta let us have a rabbit and pork here, governor! We've got things to say. No way in fuck was that your actual voice. I beg your pardon, who do you think you are? Name's Nash Skulkin. Occupation's a professional baddie. Name's Ringo Skulkin, but we ain't baddies enough to sell out our motherland. That's right! We're what they would call, um... The Three Skulkin Brothers! Bro, help me out here! Bad timing, fellas. Very bad timing. Alright, witness testimony. Spill it, baby. Give me that hot tea. A mere communications officer couldn't possibly steal confidential government information. Besides, the sounds produced by that music box aren't even Morse code. It was some low-class brickmaker. Negotiating with McGilded anyway, was it not? I simply have no relation to the man. Look, all we done was break into the gaff the other night like you told us to do. If we'd known there was dodgy government secrets involved, we wouldn't have touched it, governor. 
Okay. Nice. And we are... We are racking up the progress. Um... Mr. and Mr. Skulkin. One Mr. will do, Governor. What's up? Do I take it that you now admit to the crime? That on the night in question, you did indeed gain entry to the premises illegally. And moreover, you did so as a party of three in collaboration with Mr. Graydon here. Uh... Well, you see, uh... We did, Gov! We did. Great! I got a confession! All right, quiet and down, please. What say you to that, Mr. Graydon? I have no idea what these two ruffians are referring to. You little rotter getting us mixed up with all this monkey business. You never said nothing about no government secrets. It was supposed to be a straight up job. And what about the geezer who shop it was, eh? Poor old bloke didn't have to die, did he? <laughs> well, nice to know who your friends are. Whatever these men say, I simply deny the accusations! Indeed. Well, I certainly wasn't expecting this little music box to become so significant in the proceedings. However, as it has, I will admit it into the court record as evidence. Great! So what happens next? Oh right, the cross-examination. That is the part that I have to do, isn't it? Alright. Let's press everything. Couldn't possibly steal confidential government information. Is that accurate? So is this newspaper headline accurate? Government communications are being intercepted? Well, how could I possibly know? Well, what do you mean by that? Well, what do you mean by that? Any important government communications are handled by high-level officers. By specialists. General members of staff in the station where I work would never be entrusted with such sensitive information. Oh no! Stop! Must say something! Stop! Let me guess. Juror number five. What's up? We regular communication station officers aren't as lowly as you're being led to believe. A team of us are responsible for setting up and testing the telegraphs used by the Ministry. And Mr. Graydon is but the team leader. That's rather fascinating. Juror number five. Feel free to keep talking throughout this cross-examination. Graydon is a highly skilled operator, stop, currently in presence of the idol, stop! Oh wow, she's smitten with him. For a woman who's smitten with him, she's throwing him under the bus real fucking fast. Hmm, so you had access to the equipment used for the confidential communications, Mr. Graydon. It's all falling into place. It's all falling into place a little too easily, isn't it? Well, what of it? The transmissions are always made behind closed doors so they can't be heard. And in any case, all messages are sent in ciphered. Normal employees couldn't possibly understand them. Oh no, stop! Must say something more, stop! Mr. Graydon regularly attends meetings with Ministry Technicians and the Ministry Communications team. He assists them in ensuring that there are no errors in, imp in important international communications. He's received the top prize at the Cypher Cracking Convention five years in a row! That's... also fascinating. Holy shit. A great and his highly skilled operator, stop! Currently in presence of idol, stop! Well, your idol would appreciate it if you would shut your goddamn trap! Wow. Ugh, she should pick her idols a little more carefully. I'm telling you, this lawyer's accusations are completely unfounded. Besides, the sounds produced by the music box aren't even Morse code. Are you sure about that? They're not? To anyone with a brain, they would blatantly be apparent upon listening to that music box for even a few seconds. Of course. Is he telling the truth or is he lying? And if he's lying, does that just mean that it's a different cipher? Surely it can't be that my learned friend is unfamiliar with Morse code. Ouch. He looks genuinely shocked at my ignorance. <laughs> I would be more than happy to demonstrate the basics for you, sir. 
A lesson? Here in court? Morse code is a continuous series of two distinct tones. Oh, she said two. Tones, you say? Yes, a short dot and a long dash. By combining those in different ways, you construct letters. I see. For example, this A. This is B. But when you listen to the sound produced by this music box, you can only hear one tone, don't you? But it sounds so similar. The rhythm of it is the same in everything. But there's no discernible meaning to this apparently random sequence of sounds. So your assertion is fundamentally flawed. This is not Morse code. Um, well maybe the site, but I, well I'm not ready to give up on that. Really? You shouldn't be so surprised. <laughs> what did I tell you? Dave Abler! Hello, welcome to the chat! You got a great solar eclipse in Detroit? Nice. Wasn't it beautiful? The music box is nothing but a worthless piece of scrap. Perhaps you might consider studying your subject matter before casting aspersions in the future. I mean, yeah, but... What, you, you could use letters that are only the dots, or, like, is it, can't you, like, alter the cipher, and, and instead of doing dot and dash, you could do, like, double dots and single dots, like, da-da, dot, dot, da-da, 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 da -da, da -da, like, you know? Because I thought that's kind of what the music box was doing. I, I think there's a, I think there's a workaround here. Ugh. Fuck. It's so frustrating, isn't it, Bruno? Iris? I mean, if the government secrets were somehow being leaked using the music box, uh, so many other things would slot into place so nicely. Could there still be something I haven't considered? Would it really be impossible to use this music box somehow to play back Morse code? It seems impossible or give it a try. Can I look at the music box quick? Um... See how the form of gilded disc sits in the music box the man deposited at Windbanks? It wouldn't be a more perfect fit! Right. The sounds it produces seem to not have any meaning, it just doesn't make sense. Maybe there's more to this music box than meets the eye. Maybe we haven't discovered all of its secrets yet. Secrets, secrets, I don't know, fun secrets. What is this little switch? This is the mechanism that turns the bumps on the disc into sound. It's all thanks to the comb with its teeth that are plucked by passing the bumps. Usually, the teeth on the comb are different lengths, so that each one produces a different note. But this comb is very strange. All the teeth are exactly the same length. What does that mean? No matter which tooth is plucked by the passing bumps, the music box will make the same sound. I've never seen a music box like it before. That is strange, a music box that can only play a single note. There has to be some significance to that, surely. Right. Um, what's down here? Oh! What is it, Bruno? I've just noticed something about this music box. It looks like the bottom of it opens up as well. You're right! Well, come on, then what are you waiting for? Let's open it! Okay, yeah, sure. Oh, look at that! There's another movement on the other side! So does this mean you could set another disc to play back on this side? I think so! And it looks like the two movements are linked together! Linked? Yeah! Like if you had two discs, you would play back both at the same time! Aha! There's our second tone. So that means that there's gonna be a second disc! Well this is huge! Let's look inside of this. Who'd have thought there would be a second movement on the other side of the box? The comb's teeth are all the same length. So this movement also produces a single tone. The length of the teeth on the two combs isn't the same, so the single tone produced by this movement will be different to the single tone we've already heard. Each movement can only produce a single note, but the notes they produce are different. Wow, this is a very convoluted music box scheme of uh, throwing these things back. Okay. Well... 
have I, have, by investigating this, have I gotten enough information? I think so. I think so. I think so. I think we're good. Okay, so in that case, would it be impossible, would it really be possible, wait, what? No, give it a tr- would it- to mute- to somehow playback- give it a try. We- we have- there- there's still every possibility that this music box was instrumental in the leaking of government secrets. That's the belief of the defense, at least. Objection. I- can I present this to the court? Does it please you in some way, my Nipponese friends, to repeat the same line of argument in infin infinitum? It's already been established that to be Morse code, two tones are required, dots and dashes. Yeah, I'm well aware of that. Then what? Well, it would appear the defense has a hypothesis to put forward. You had better present your idea at once, counsel. How do you propose this music box, which appears to produce only a single tone, could have been used to cipher secret messages into Morse code? Girl, I'm about to blow your fucking mind. Oh, fuck. Wrong button, wrong button, wrong button. Okay. Oh, no, right button, right button. Right here. Girl, look at this. Oh, good gracious. What am I looking at here? Another movement on the underside of the music box. It appears, my lord, that the two movements are linked together. In other words, you can put two discs in the music box, and the sounds of both will play back at the same time. Oh, good heavens. As the court has heard, Morse code comprises of two tones, a short dot and a long dash. With a second disc in place, this music box could be used to generate Morse code and convey a message. Nice. Well, this is beyond a joke. Sorry? This poor excuse for a lawyer is absolutely no evidence to support his claim. Though, of course, if my learned friend were able to present the court with a second disc, that would be another matter. Will? Um... Well, I can't at this exact moment in time. Hmm. And may I remind the court that as the witnesses pointed out, he was not the one in the omnibus with McGilded two months ago striking a deal over the disc or discs. Well, yeah, that was Mr. Mason, the Brickmaster. Exactly! I had nothing whatsoever to do with it! Um... Well, though it has holes, I must admit the argument presented by the defense has much promise. I believe the cross-examination should continue. The link between Graydon and the victim of the Omnibus case. That's what I have to find. It's gotta be in here somewhere. Oh dear! It looks like you need to give your argument more strength, Runo! You will reiterate your testimony, if you please, Mr. Graydon. If I must, though I maintain exactly what I did at the start of this pointless cross-examination. Alright, some low-class brickmaker negotiating with McGill in any way, I have no relation to the man. Press that. So two months ago in that omnibus, McGill had killed the brickmaker and stole the disc. Mr. Mason was a single man with almost nothing to his name. It seems he lived in an artisan quarter some years ago, but people there remember little about him. That just doesn't make much sense though, does it? How would a humble brickmaker come to acquire secret government information? How oh, indeed. Alright, I have a hypothesis. If if the brickmaker is this poor ass poverty stricken loser who needs some extra money, is it not feasible that a commu a rich communications guy like Mr. Eggs Benedict could just like throw money at him and say, here, take this disc. You're going to do the deal on my behalf, so I don't have to be anywhere near it, and I will pay you handsomely for it. Like, something like that? Probably. There had to have been somebody else involved behind the scenes in all of this. Somebody who acquired the disc and gave it to Mr. Mason, in order to take it to the meeting with Mr. McGilded and negotiate a deal. Yeah, 
That's basically what I said. Dear me! You may have it in for me, sir, but I assure you, I have far more class than that. An old brickmaker from an artisan quarter and his well-to-do communications officer. If only I could find some evidence to link the two of them together. Hmm. Well, if you have nothing more to add on that note, let us return to the witness testimony. Um... Maybe we could press them. We probably will. Before I do, though, let me just double check. Is there anything that I have that could link them? Skulking Brothers gun, Windebank gun, crime scene photo, autopsy report. Article, gilded case notes. Mason Milverton, male, occupation, brickmaker, east end of London. Uh... Okay, Milverton. Graydon, Ashley, Windebank. Thrice fired Mason with the purple. Maybe the pawnbroker ticket? The blood on it has been identified as Mr. Mason's. One gentleman's overcoat, one pound. Mr. Mason's blood. Hmm. That could maybe be it. Let me finish my pressing, and then we'll work on evidence. We'll, we'll, we'll just see if this goes anywhere. Like Mr. Graydon told you to do. That's what you mean to say? Yeah, that's it. Who else, eh? Silly me, though. Thought I was just popping over for a netter of them all these years, but then the router dodgy shot for us. <laughs> what? My guy's talking like Jojo fucking Siwa. Ain't that right, Ashley? It's Graydon. Let me stop you right there, Mr. Skulkin. After all them years? Wait, 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 what? Oh, shit, that... I missed that. Do you mean to say that Mr. Graydon, I'm sorry, Ashley, is an acquaintance of yours? We're the sociable kind of baddies, you know what I mean? Sure, let's just say that Graydon's uh, an old China. What? Okay, here we go, we're getting somewhere. Excuse me. Is something wrong, Mr. Skulkin? Eh! No, no, the other, the other one. What? Oh, who? Me? When your brother was testifying just now, he said something that seemed to cause you to react. Oh, I was just remembering the old days is all. We used to have a right old laugh together way back when. Together? With Ashley? You mean? Yeah, with Ash. I mean... You look at him now in his fancy whistling flute, and you wouldn't add him any of it. But when we was younger, he was from the poor part of town just like us. The east end of London? Is that so? But he was always a leery one. Add, he did the brains, he had the savvy. Always coming up with smart ideas like what would never have gone through our heads. Go on, Blimey! Ain't that the truth? Remember Milverton and Skulkin's Milk Run? I'm so fucking sorry. Did you just say... Milverton? Checkmate! Close the books! They were accomplices in the past! Mason Milverton, thrice-fired Mason, Milverton and Skulkin's Milk Run. Oh my god, are they the two baddies on horseback that robbed Cremia, Cremia of her milk? On her horse? In her carriage? That was a corker, eh? Save it until after the trial. Your reminiscing has no place in this courtroom. Objection, I think it does. And neither does your fruit. Okay, homophobic. Calm down. Oi! That geezer asked us a question, didn't he? And we was answering! 
Yeah, we ain't done nothing wrong. Nevertheless, the court is not prepared to accompany you on your trip down memory lane. Counsel, can we turn our attention back to the testimony, please? I don't know. That sentimental story seems very rel- Yeah, add it to the testimony. For sure. Uh, my lord. Yes, counsel? The brother's last sentimental statement could hold vital information relating to this case. Very well, counsel. I will permit the brothers to supplement their testimony with the detail. Briefly, I hasten to add. That's all I need. All I need is the name. Just say the name and we're golden. Milver- There it is. There's the name. Okay. I have some type of evidence, I think. Wait. Do I? Well... Wait. Was it the ticket? Where was his name? Oh, wait. Maybe it was the case notes. <laughs> Fuck me. <laughs> I lost the evidence I needed. This one. Yeah, the detail of the, of the victim. His name was Mason Milverton. Okay, here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, case notes. Objection. Wait. Fuck. Damn it, I did this wrong. But, like, okay. Game, can't you just give this one to me? What the fuck? Do I have to press it again and before I present? Alright, you know what? Fuck Damn off. It. You guys suck a bag of dicks. Alright, tell me more about it so then I can- Like, the name's there, Judge! Judge, fuck you, you're a little- I disagree. Kangaroo Court! Alright, anyways, go on, tell me about it. Well, it was just a little scheme we had going back when we was the youngsters. Bit of fun, really. Delivering fresh milk to the locals, that's what it was all about. And fucking the housewives. That sounds alarmingly legitimate, there's gotta be a catch. I suppose since we're here, I should ask them to elaborate, but on what? Business name! Fuck! So this business was just a bit of fun, you say? And it was just yourselves and Mr. Graydon involved? Yeah, that's it! Milverton and Skulkin's milk run, was it? Yeah, that's it. And where did, uh, the Milverton part come from? Alright! I thought a clever clock like you would have worked it out, but that's... what? ENOUGH OF THIS! Oh, he's gonna try to shut them up! How much longer are we expected to listen to this drivel? I don't... Mm -mm. You are not cutting me off right now. You don't accept anything these two witnesses are saying? Tell me, why is it that it was only at the mention of the name Milverton that you decided to interject? Well, because I will, um... It weren't the happiest of homes that he came from. Yeah, his old man was struggling for money so much, his wife walked out on him. Yeah, she got fucked by one of the milkmen. Ha, ha. Yeah, she did, Nash. Yeah, she did. She took the name Graydon, then, you see. But Ash will always be Milverton to us. Milverton. So that used to be your surname, did it? Of course not! This is all buncombe! What? But? What? Huh? Gay? I've been Graydon since I was born! Do you really think you can rely on the testimony of these two thieves? You are a communications officer attached to the civil service. As such, your personal details will have been thoroughly checked at the time of your appointment. It would be a very simple matter indeed to subpoena those records, Mr. Graydon. Ugh. Buncombe is nonsense. Well, it would appear that Mr. and Mr. Skulkin's testimony has been reliable for once. You were born Ashley Milverton, then. Is that correct? Very well, yes. So Ashley Graydon was once Ashley Milverton. That information could change things, and could turn out to be extremely important. There it is. Okay. 
All of a sudden, we seem to be up to our necks in a serious matter of national security. Although, all this talk about interception of secret government messages is still just conjecture at this stage. It would explain a number of things, though, wouldn't it? The negotiation Ginny overheard on the omnibus two months ago, and the breaking of windowbanks? But the trouble is, it wasn't Mr. Graydon in the omnibus with Mr. McGilded. No, that was Mr. Mason, the brickmaker, who was so horribly murdered. Hmm, if only there was some link between the two of them. Right, uh, we're, we're getting to that. Okay. So now I should be able to present. Um, it was a low-class brickmaker. I have no relation to the man. Really, because I have something to say about that. Objection. Thank God. <laughs> Alright, here we go. Uh, Mr. Ashley? Ashley Milverton? Ashley? Is there an Ashley in the courtroom? Oh, sorry. Ashley! Um, your name's Milverton, right? Tell me, why did you try to hide your former name from the courts? Because I haven't gone by that name for years. It means nothing to me. No, I don't think that's the real explanation at all. The truth is, you had a reason to hide that name. Yeah. Explain yourself, please, counsel. I have here the notes from the omnibus case, my lord. And as we all know, the victim, the man who we now understand to have been negotiating with McGilded, Yes, Mr. Mason, the brickmaker. That's right. Only Mason wasn't his surname at all. It was his given name. His full name was Mason Milverton. Mil? Milverton? What do you mean to say? Oh, I mean to say, Ashley Milverton. He is not the case that the, the, uh, Mr. Ashley, is it not the case that the brickmaker, Mr. Mason Milverton, was your father? Uh, I don't... As I believe I mentioned earlier, your family history will have been thoroughly checked when you joined the civil service, and it really would take no time at all for the courts to subpoena those records. Girl... The truth is, you've been illegally acquiring highly confidential government information and selling it on to McGilded in collaboration with your father. <laughs> Got him. Did, did we win? Did we solve the case? Am I done here? The new facts and evidence unveiled by the cross-examination of this witness all come together to reveal the truth. The truth, you say? The truth that you collaborated with your father, Mr. Mason Milverton, in illegal dealings with Magnus McGilded. By dint of this music box, you mean, Counsel? Yes. Stealing information being sent in secret government communications and selling it to McGilded. Mr. Graydon concocted this elaborate scheme of using two music box discs to encode the information. As presumably a safety measure against the information falling into the wrong hands. And a very effective one. I shouldn't have given the scheme any credence whatsoever. But the deal with McGilded went sour, and the brickmaker met his end. Well, yeah. But before he was arrested, McGilded managed to temporarily dispose of the stolen disc at the pawnbroker. Then, having learnt of the situation, you appeared at Windebanks two days ago in an attempt to recover the two articles McGilded had placed in pawn there. But that attempt failed. One of the discs was seized by the police, and the other... you never found. So that same night, you enlisted the help of the Skulkin brothers and broke into the pawn brokery. This time, determined to recover the second disc. Are you suggesting that the second disc was inside the music box? Eh? We never knew nothing about that. On the night that Mr. Windebank was killed. Look at this photograph. The intruder to the pawn brokery touched one item and one item alone. The music box. That's rather ingeniously demonstrated using the two prints from the security camera indeed. So the question that naturally begs answering is this. Why was only one article disturbed? The answer is obvious, because it contains the second disc, which the intruder was desperate to retrieve. 
Since, if it were to fall into the hands of the police, it would be proof of his high treason. Well, Mr. Ashley Graydon Mir Mil Mil Malkovich, do you deny that all of this actually began on that fateful night two months ago? I... I... I refuse to accept any of this nonsense! So what happens now? Uh, sir. There appears to be a little bit of... Um, blood. Sleeping, seeping through the sleeve of your jacket? No? What? Ugh! Hmm. That's funny. You know, two nights ago, we know that uh, three shots were fired at the scene of the crime in Windebank's pawn brokery. We know that one took the life of the pawnbroker himself, and we know that one struck the pouch around Mr. Sholmes' waist, and then the final bullet. Well, that one struck the calendar on the wall of the shop, having first pierced the arm of one of the intruders. Hmm. Mr. Graydon, that wound on your arm that you seem to be trying to hide, it's a bullet wound, isn't it? He's got you now, me old China. Time to call it quits and croak, I reckon. That's what I reckon. <laughs> Don't acknowledge my presence there under any circumstances whatsoever. Those were my terms, remember? And I paid you handsomely to comply. Oh. Is this a confession? Well, clearly I was a fool to think I could trust some common backslum thieves. This sounds like a confession. Fine! I admit it. I was there in Windebanks that night. I paid this pat and guineas to accompany me. And as you've noticed, I sustained an injury in the course of my adventures. So, I won? But that is all. I admit to nothing more. Stealing government secrets, negotiating with Mr. McGilded. Uh, uh, mm, uh. As God is my witness, I'm sure I recall nothing of this- Oh, really? You're gonna use the man who's gonna damn you to hell as your witness? Alright, fine. Yeah, as God is my witness too, hunty. He's not going down without a fight. Not until I can show hard evidence, I suppose. Nevertheless, the defense has now established a crucial fact. Which is what? Well, we know that one bullet was fired from each of the two firearms we have in evidence. The bullet from the Skulkin Brothers' gun hit the pouch around Mr. Sholmes' waist. And the bullet from Mr. Windebank's gun clearly must have been the one that caught Mr. Graydon on the arm. Indeed it must. We can rule out the possibility that the man shot himself. And that leads us only to one conclusion. Mr. Windebank was shot by a third gun. Which can only have been fired by the third intruder. Oh, goodness. Ha! That's right, Mr. Graydon. <clears throat> the only person who could possibly have shot Mr. Windebank that night is, uh, you. It's you, it's you, oh. it's only you. What? <laughs> you little upstart! You made a grave mistake when you summoned me here. How so? And what does that mean? Yes, as you rightly say, I was there at Pawn Brokery. The Pawn Brokery. And I did my best to hide the fact, naturally. I had no intention of ruining the distinguished career I had built for myself at the communication station. But did the thought ever cross your mind? Did you ever consider the possibility? Oh, where are you going with this, my guy? The possibility that if I was there at the scene, that I may have witnessed the crucial moment? You see... This makes me a key witness on the case, and I have my hands FIRMLY around the neck of your client. What? Your Honor, he's threatening my client! Are you suggesting? 
I saw it all, your lordship. I saw the very moments the pickpocket girl pointed the gun at the poor defenseless pawnbroker and shot him. You what? Obje I, you're, come on, this is lunacy. Order! Well, it would seem we are finally entering the last act of this theatrical trial. I thought we answered that five acts ago. Mr. Graydon. Yes? I trust you are fully aware of the implications here. If it is shown that your claim is false, you will have incriminated yourself as the killer. Oh, I understand fully what I'm doing. I mean, yeah, even if he didn't... If, 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 if he didn't pull this Hail Mary, he's being incriminated as the killer anyways, so... I, I get the logic between behind pulling a, a, a Hail Mary here. Well, then I must ask you to give your formal testimony once more. You will explain to the court precisely what you saw at the moment the defendants allegedly shot the victim. Nothing would give me greater pleasure. Alright, that means we have yet another witness testimony for the moment of the shooting, and it's going to happen tomorrow. Not gonna lie, guys, I feel like we made some pretty fucking incredible progress today, and I do feel very high on the confidence scale that we'll be able to finish this game this week. So, yeah, if you guys are excited to see everything culminate to its finale and me lock up my final criminal... Uh, be here tomorrow, 7 o'clock Eastern Time, where I will get the next testimony out of Mr. Eggs Benedict. You, maybe we can even finish this tomorrow? I don't know. I don't think you'll be able to finish tomorrow, but you should be able to get to the final cross-examination segment. Okay, cool. Good to know. All right, guys, if you guys could leave a like on the stream, the engagement is super helpful. Thank you for spending your Eclipse evening with me, and uh, I will see you in the next one. All right, boys? Toodles!